in an attempt to defame me, my soon to be ex-wife asked me, in front of court clerk, do you still think you're an alien from outer space? Everyone saw how crazy she was and sided with me in court. What is the greatest way someone has attempted to humiliate or harass you, which ended up backfiring? This is something my father did. So at the time my dad was working at a advertising company or something. I forget. It's not really important. What is important is it was a very professional environment. Every day he'd put on a fancy schmancy suit and tie and work in a very fancy schmancy building. One day a new employee was promoted to his floor or something like that. The new guy was pretty young, like fresh out of college, almost. Turns out there were two other guys who worked with my dad that went to the same college as the new guy. I'll call them Ted and Teddy. Immediately the new guy started to look up to them. He'd go to them for advice and whatnot. After about three days Ted and Teddy decided to play a prank on the new guy. So they decide they should tell him that the next Friday was a Hawaiian shirt day, but of course it wasn't. They tell my dad about it beforehand and ask if he can email him about it too, so it looks like everyone knows about it. My dad says he'll do it. So my dad emails the new guy about a Hawaiian shirt day. Then he emails his boss and fills him in on the situation, but instead of just ratting out Ted and Teddy, he and his boss organize an actual Hawaiian shirt day and tell everyone in the office, except Ted and Teddy. Meanwhile, my dad tells Ted and Teddy that the coming Friday is corporate picture day, so they'll dress super fancy. The picture of my dad's whole office, dressed in Hawaiian shirts, except two dudes in the back wearing fancy suits is priceless. This is something my father did. So at the time my dad was working at a advertising company or something. I forget. It's not really important. What is important is it was a very professional environment. Every day he'd put on a fancy schmancy suit and tie and work in a very fancy schmancy building. One day a new employee was promoted to his floor or something like that. The new guy was pretty young, like fresh out of college, almost. Turns out there were two other guys who worked with my dad that went to the same college as the new guy. I'll call them Ted and Teddy. Immediately the new guy started to look up to them. He'd go to them for advice and whatnot. After about three days Ted and Teddy decided to play a prank on the new guy. So they decide they should tell him that the next Friday was a Hawaiian shirt day, but of course it wasn't. They tell my dad about it beforehand and ask if he can email him about it too, so it looks like everyone knows about it. My dad says he'll do it. So my dad emails the new guy about a Hawaiian shirt day. Then he emails his boss and fills him in on the situation, but instead of just ratting out Ted and Teddy, he and his boss organize an actual Hawaiian shirt day and tell everyone in the office, except Ted and Teddy. Meanwhile, my dad tells Ted and Teddy that the coming Friday is corporate picture day, so they'll dress super fancy. The picture of my dad's whole office, dressed in Hawaiian shirts, except two dudes in the back wearing fancy suits is priceless. My dad used to be work in the maintenance department at a very expensive and very high class boys only high school. It was actually a pretty respectable job, requiring a plethora of trade qualifications and a working brain. He was pretty committed to the job and often pulled over time on the weekends. But, because it was a rich school in a rich area there was a lot of snobbery involved. Kids parents were as holes, the kids were practically uncontrollable. Dad handled it all by just being incredibly good at his job and never getting mad, just even. So, one Saturday morning he goes into the workshop on campus to build some new tables and desks. At 9 o'clock he gets in, makes coffee and gets set up before turning on the extractor fans in the workshop that remove the sawdust. As a side note you're legally allowed to operate machinery like this from 7 o'clock in the morning onwards, in terms of noise pollution restrictions QR guy, most likely a parent of one of the boys at the school, storming over from his house in the properties behind the workshop, in his dressing gown. Absolutely flips his sheet, screaming at dad to turn the machinery off. Dad just stands his ground, explains that he's allowed to be running it, and waited until mid-morning out of courtesy. That's not good enough and this guy starts making threats along the lines of they know me at the college, I know people, I can have you sacked, who is your supervisor? Dad says, I can give you the maintenance supervisor's number, and hands the guy a business card. Guy pulls out his mobile and dials the number. 
he's staring dad in the face, still pumped up and ready to start bagging him out to the supervisor. Dad's phone rings. He pulls it out, answers it and says, scotch underscore cub senior, maintenance supervisor apostrophe the guy flipped his sheet completely, threw the card back at dad and stormed out. My first long term boyfriend cheated on me during our senior year of high school, then led me on for months by saying, I wanna be with you, I just need some time apart. We are still together, I just wanna see other people too. Like any socially inept shy and secure high schooler, I went along with it for quite some time, before calling it quits for good. However, my ex had promised me long before, that he would take me to the senior prom that year, no matter what happened between us. In the weeks leading up to prom, I order a modest looking dress online, buy my ticket, book a hair appointment, the whole shebang. So, one week before that prom night, I find out from mutual friends that he's taking the 14 year old who he cheated on me with to the prom instead of me, and I'd also been told that my ex wasn't going to tell me about it. He'd been planning on letting me buy a dress, spend the entire prom day getting ready, and then he was going to stand me up on prom night. So I asked his recently single best friend to take me, because we'd already been friends 4 years before, and he'd just broken up with his girlfriend. I return the modest dress I'd bought online, and take the money to a local dress shop. I buy a sexy, flaming red prom dress that shows off my legs, back, and bust, sky high black stilettos. I forego the intricate hairstyle for a sexy haircut instead. I looked good. I showed up for the pre-prom dinner at a restaurant, where my date, his friend and his girlfriend, and my ex and his new girlfriend are waiting at the table. I walk down the path leading to the table, like it's a catwalk. Every eye in the restaurant is on me. For 30 seconds, I commanded an entire room. I danced the night away with my prom date, while my ex fumed to himself in the corner, refusing to dance with his girl. He left early. My date and I go back to my house, where we have the longest, most intimate conversation of my life. We talk about our lives, our childhoods, who we both are, and who we both want to be, everything. We talk until the sun comes up. My ex's best friend and I are now happily married. So really, every day that I live, is a day, that my ex's plan, to humiliate me is backfiring. Hopefully this doesn't get buried, but here goes. My best, guy, friend had moved out of his fiancés and his house after a 7 year relationship. He's kind of a sucker, but a good person. He rented a small house down the street from his mom, and since the fiancé owed him a sheet ton of money, she gave him a washer and dryer, a table, etc. He was trying to keep the relationship alive as well as get some much needed space. He really didn't want to break up with her. One day, she decides that he's cheating on her. He wasn't. He was at my house drinking and playing poker with my brother and a few other guy friends. She flips the fuck out on him when he gets home. She has a house key and is lurking in the house refusing to come out when he gets there. Says she's waiting on a guy friend of hers to bring a trailer and a dolly so she can take her sheet out of his house. My pal calls the cops. A bunch of bullshit goes on there but she leaves before they can get there. She then tries to file personal protection orders on he and his mother. She lied about the both of them threatening her life in order to do so. My pal decided to contest the PPO and take her to court. In Michigan, you can have someone who isn't a lawyer speak for you in court. He asked me. I couldn't object to any of the other attorney's arguments. He made some outrageous accusations, even asking me if my pal had ever tried to sleep with me, and when I told him no, on the stand, he then asked me if my pal was gay, but I could question every witness, including the fiancé. She went up to the witness stand last. As soon as she got up there, she went into a crazy crying fit, I mean, sobbing, blowing snot bubbles, the whole nine yards. My question was this. Fiance, what did you bring into my pal's house with you? She replied, a Nyan Bali club my cop friend gave me. I asked her if it was in plain sight, and she stupidly replied, no, I had it up the sleeve of my sweatshirt. The judge called a halt to the proceedings and dismissed all of the PPO attempts. He then assigned her 50 hours of anger management classes, and when she shrieked, he threw her in jail for contempt of court. As she was being led away she said to me, bitch I'm gonna get you. 
I asked for a PPO on her right then and there, and it was granted on the spot. Insert success kid here. TLDR crazy woman puts her own foot in her mouth in court, reversing the original charges she sought out onto her. My ex pulled similar stunts in our divorce and custody fight. She claimed in affidavits that I was suicidal, homicidal, violent, had anger management issues, abusing prescription and illegal drugs basically everything short of molesting our child, which my attorney expressed surprise at. As we walked into court on the first day she said that if our child had been a female we'd be fighting such accusations. Her attorney also tried very hard to portray me as a stereotypical military vet with deep emotional problems. So my ex petitions the court to have me undergo a psych eval. The judge looked at me and asked, Mr. Did Kaz Moustache, how do you feel about this? I said that I had no problem with it, but it would probably be a good idea if the ex had one too. He found the idea delightful and even allowed my ex to choose the doctor to administer it. So we go through the psych eval thing. This was a total of about 6 or 8 hours in the doc's office over the course of several days. The day before the divorce trial starts we get the results back. Mr. Did Kaz Moustache has mild symptoms of situational depression, which is no surprise as his wife has been conducting at least one, and as many as several affairs blah blah blah. There is no indication of suicidal or homicidal tendencies, nor drug abuse, nor violence, nor antisocial behavior. He's basically a good guy going through a shitty divorce. Mrs. Did Kaz Moustache has a non-specific borderline personality disorder, a narcissistic personality disorder, and three of the five standardized tests used to evaluate her were invalidated because she lied on them. Here's a very cool part. When I went to settle the bill at the doc's office his nurse pulled me aside and said we don't get emotionally involved with our clients, Mr. Did Kaz Moustache, but everyone in this office is pulling for you. Apparently the ex had stormed in and let the entire staff up in spectacular fashion over the diagnosis. My attorney's secretary also let me know that my ex's attorney's secretaries, seems that these folks talk outside of class a lot, were very hopeful that my ex would get ramroded by the court. In the end, I was granted custody of my son and the judge included some very sharp language about my ex's testimony and integrity that I'm told will be my primary weapon should she ever choose to contest any aspect of either the divorce or custody rulings. My favorite quote her answers were evasive, disingenuous, and, at times, breathtakingly unbelievable thanks, yeah honor. TLDR, X went from a tropical storm to a category 5 hurricane in the courtroom. I was like the mighty willow who bent, but did not break. I was born for this thread as well here are a few 6th grade to 7th I sat with the Yugo o table. Let's face it at such a young age it was a fantastic card game. And a lot of people in middle school agreed. While we were the center of attention to bullies we also had 3 tables overflowing with people who wanted to play cards with us. It turned into long row of tables with pretty much any card game you can name, but that didn't stop people from annoying us with their retarded insults. Now I played baseball with one of the popular kids named Corey. He was secretly a nerd, and I encouraged him to embrace that side of him. He also happened to hang out with all those bullies. So one day they come walking up. Everyone his the little group starts making fun of us, calling us names, and Corey was just grinning at me. Finally one of them says, can you believe these nerds Corey? And Corey goes, yo man, me, can I play around with you? He then sits in front of me and pulls out his UGIO cards with complete with card covers. The look on everyone's faces. That alone made my year. By 9th grade I received a new title. I was no longer that nerd. I was that quiet kid that showed no emotion. A lot of bullies gave up on bullying me. Halfway through the year I was known as that really nice quiet kid that everyone wished would talk more. I received a reputation I never wanted. People who made middle school a living hell for me now tried to invite me to parties because I was chill it did have its perks though. There was this douchebag that just didn't seem to get it. I don't react to bullies, but he was so persistent till eventually he shoved me into a wall. I just kind of stood there grinning while the people he expected to start laughing at me surrounded him. That was a good day for me as well. I got the ultimate revenge. 
bullies from middle school that I still despised with a passion stood up for me and beat up another bully then then got suspended for beating him up. Uh, okay, I have a different lodge in at work. My boss has been a bit of a control freak since we hired him a couple years ago. Largely, we all put up with him, though the people he supervises can all do the job better than he. Not that unusual, even in a technical field like mine. Anyway, he got frustrated one evening when he saw me helping another coworker with their stuff and let me know that we would have to have a meeting in the morning with his boss to redefine my workload. See, if he didn't tell me to help employee X that he dislikes with their work, I shouldn't be helping with their work. I guess I have more team spirit than my boss. Next morning, at the appointed time, I stick my head in the door of boss boss office and say do we have a meeting? With a knowing grin, boss boss says, is boss here yet? And I say, yeah, I just saw him, I'll go get him, so. Boss has a couple petty grievances, and then says there have been some times when I'm setting something up, and you know it, and you leave early. If you know I'm working on setting up processes in the afternoon, can you stick around to help? And I knew I was gold. Processes is something my boss should have learned how to do over two years ago. So I raise my eyebrows and carefully say with as little scorn and derision as humanly possible, if I were to stick around and help out, do you think you could learn processes so I don't have to stay late next time? And my boss replies with yes, of course. Just so you know, the only reason I don't know processes is because at all my previous companies we used process ABC. And I knew I heard him. Five minutes later, I walked out of boss boss office grinning because my boss just embarrassed himself in front of his boss and didn't even know it. I knew that right then. Boss boss was saying to boss you don't know this? That's something you should know and voila. A couple months later, my boss is learning new tricks, including this. I know that this is the guy filling out my evils and the three of us know I'll let him hang and I just cannot bring myself to care. The whole company knows his history and we have made a habit of working around him, so fuck it. I'm a singer, and not a bad one. One day, I decided to make a YouTube video. My idea sparked the interest of another friend from my old school. She and her friend started this thing called the Katie and Catalin show, but I wasn't aware of it. I got a Facebook message from Katie one day, but it seemed off, like it was intended for someone else. The fact that is, was indeed for someone else was clarified when she said, Oh my god did you see Kennedy's video? She's like so loud it's pathetic. I mean, sheesh, we can hear you. She said other hurtful things, but I don't feel like repeating them. She intended to send that to Catelyn, explaining how I 100% know that is difficult. Our names both start with K, so I guess she just clicked the wrong person. I confronted her, and she acted like she didn't send any message at all. About a week later, a friend told me about their web show, and was pretty insistent that I checked it out. I watched a couple videos, they didn't seem all that amazing. Then I got to the third one. They were fixing their hair, and then Katie said to the camera, Guys, go look up, my full name here, if you want to see someone sound like they're dying. She almost breaks the camera, it's hilarious. Amongst other hateful things. So this proved that she really was talking about me, even though it was obvious to begin with. But that's not the good part. I was texting my other friend and told her why I was having a bad day. Turns out my other friend was cousins with Catelyn and she told her aunt about what they did. 10 seconds later the video was deleted and they acted like I was crazy and that I was making things up. Two years later, and I have won seven vocal competitions and I'm acting in the official Virginia State Outdoor Drama. Fuck you, Katie. I'm a trainee that was being hosted by her pa, technically employed by a GTO. One day my, very recently promoted, boss starts drilling me on not following his instructions to the letter for the fifth time. Each time I had fixed the problem instead of following his policy of simply replacing the computer, none of the computers had broken after my repairs. I say stuff it, I'm out of here, if I stay then I'm probably going to kill this man. This new boss then proceeds to modify all of my job tickets from my year and a half of work to prove his point. 
the ticket service fails and corrupts the database they recover the database from before he edited them, his boss notices the disparity and gives me his apologies for various actions that they took, Aka firing me, locking me out of sight, etc. The new boss gets a disciplinary hearing. Meanwhile the company that was technically employing me has put me on full time. In this company there's only two it people including myself, and the other one is pretty awesome, all the people are friendly, and I'm feeling more fulfilled in my work. TLDR got fired from a crappy job because of my crappy boss falsifying records. The boss got caught and my labor hire company, not my original employer, employed me in their office instead. I'm a trainee that was being hosted by her pa, technically employed by a GTO. One day my, very recently promoted, boss starts drilling me on not following his instructions to the letter for the fifth time. Each time I had fixed the problem instead of following his policy of simply replacing the computer, none of the computers had broken after my repairs. I say stuff it, I'm out of here, if I stay then I'm probably going to kill this man. This new boss then proceeds to modify all of my job tickets from my year and a half of work to prove his point. The ticket service fails and corrupts the database they recover the database from. Before he edited them, his boss notices the disparity and gives me his apologies for various actions that they took. Aka firing me, locking me out of sight, etc. The new boss gets a disciplinary hearing. Meanwhile the company that was technically employing me has put me on full time. In this company there's only two it people including myself, and the other one is pretty awesome, all the people are friendly, and I'm feeling more fulfilled in my work. TLDR got fired from a crappy job, because of my crappy boss falsifying records, the boss got caught, and my labor hire company, not my original employer, employed me in their office instead. When I was in school I worked in a grocery store. I'm Canadian and the check stands had the American exchange rate hanging on the side in view. It was a regular day, lines were slowing down, but it was still busy. My next customer was a man who was clearly looking to fight. It didn't take long to learn he was American. He started in on how stupid Canadians are, because our dollar is much lower than this. We are stupid because we rely on a queen to run our country, we don't, she just looks fantastic in a crown in the paintings hanging in pubs. We are stupid for endless reasons that I'll spare details on, but they were a far cry from being justifiable. But his ignorant rantings were all proof of how much Americans know about idiot us and how we are the retarded younger sibling. This of course, conflicting the international news story, aired at the time, about how a whopping percentage of Americans knew very little about their own country, let alone the rest of the world. I can see that the check stands around me have joined my line in listening in. Frankly, we all had something to say, but you have to be careful with irate screaming people. He was quickly losing control from the moment he saw the exchange rate. What it came down to was that I somehow representing all of Canada, suddenly, was so stupid that, chuckling, I bet you don't even know baby trivia like where the White House is located. I said sure I do. Washington DC. He yelled wrong, you effing idiot. Pointing finger in my face, it's Washington state. Man gets more upset, there's conversation between him and his wife and another customer, yada yada yada, security escorts him out. TLDR it's sheet like this, that gives Americans a bad reputation. When I was in college, I had a pretty tight budget. I drove this little piece of sheet Toyota. It cost a total of $3500, brand new, and I swear it was constructed of nothing more than paper and bits of glue. Still, it was reliable, and I often drove my boyfriend around town in it, even though he preferred to drive. You see, he didn't think much of my driving, despite the fact that I'd had no accidents or tickets. He's fairly critical, in general, but my driving is a sensitive subject for both of us, and had been the subject of many a fight. On this particular night, we are driving back to campus from his parents' house on one of those divided residential roads. Traffic lights, stop signs and 45 miles per hour speed limits. It's late, so the street is mostly deserted, and the air is a dense black. My city doesn't mount street lights in residential areas, so the darkness is broken only by my weak headlights, and the occasional flashing red of disabled traffic signals. 
Another car is riding along to my right, about a car length behind. It's in my blind spot, and all I can see is the splash of its headlights and a vague auto shape lurking in the shadows. Ahead, I see a car coming the opposite direction, waiting to turn left at a brightly lit intersection. I've just crested a hill, and I'm only a short distance away. In my head, I tell the car not to turn, in a totally polite fashion, of course. It decides not to heed my advice, and turns anyway. I yell some choice words, but only have to tap my brakes to avoid a collision. It's at this point we encounter trouble you see, another car is behind the one I just barely missed hitting, and as if the two are connected by an invisible wire, the second one turns right after the first. The car is packed with people, young, from the looks of it. I can still see the shocked face of the teenage girl in the back seat highlighted by the glare of my incoming headlights. I'm already in the intersection as they turn, and I'm going 45 miles per hour. They do not turn quickly. It's as if they do not see me at all, and I know at that moment that someone is going to die. I freeze for a split second before stomping on the brakes. They scream in agony and my boyfriend and I are thrown against our seatbelts. At that moment, a voice in my head screams swerve, and I yank the wheel to my left. The car accelerates through its doomed turn, perhaps just realizing that they are not alone on the road. My tiny white car whips around the back bumper, missing it by a fraction of an inch. I see the stout metal pole of a street light, directly ahead. It's mounted on a median, and my left swerve has put me directly in its path. Again, my mind screams that magic word and my body reacts. I've never been more proud of my crappy, cheap little car as it responds immediately, swerving back to the right, arriving back on the road, in my lane, pointed forward. Almost as if we jumped over the intersection, rather than traversing it in a drunk metal slalom. I sit there a moment, stunned. My boyfriend is frozen, blinking, owl-like. I look in my rearview mirror, checking casualties. I see the car that was cruising in my blind spot just moments before, also stopped and unharmed. Now, though, the shadowy form is bathed in the light of the intersection and I can clearly see that, yes, you guess it, it's a highway patrol car. We all sit for a moment, processing the hand of death that has just touched us, paused, and moved on. The highway patrol office blinks his lights at me, and then turns to pursue the car that nearly killed us all. They are pulled over a hundred feet or so up the road. I start giggling uncontrollably. From a release of adrenaline combined with the ironic glee of having the highway patrol around when I need them, I'm laughing like a loon, crowing, nearly in tears. My boyfriend has yet to utter a word. His hands are gripping the dashboard, two bony, white-knuckled claws. As I pull away slowly to continue my trek back to campus, I get my second vindication of the night. He turns to me, saying calmly, I will never make fun of your driving again. That was faking amazing. TLDR, made amazing save to avoid an accident in front of a cop, boyfriend admits he was wrong. Warning, incoming long story. I worked at a hiring firm a while back. It wasn't great work, and I didn't enjoy the type of flexible ethics the job required, but I enjoyed all the applicants I'd get to meet and find jobs for. That said, the CEO of the company, and it was a small one office company, was an absolute loony, or maybe she was just way too old. She was also a massive control freak, and had to have her hand in every pot, even though she was only in the office one week of the month, and spent the rest of it at home about a day's drive away from the city. Anyway, when I started, I didn't think she was too bad. A little old fashioned, but I could work with that, but the other young employees warned me that she really was the worst. I didn't really believe them until after they both quit. I guess it focused her targeting a bit, so she would always single me out as some sort of failure, even though I was one of the few people in the office who would leave work every day with all my work done, although, to be fair to the other people who worked there, I handled lots of static tech stuff and only a small portion of the hiring process, whereas they were the ones dealing with clients and potential candidates for said clients. So my stuff was, really, much easier. She was constantly convinced that I was taking unnecessary shortcuts or sweeping my work under the rug. Apparently, being able to work quickly with a computer is impossible if the 70-something-year-old CEO can't do it too. 
in a hoe. Fast forward a bit, and we hire a new recruiter to the industrial department, the department I was working in, as well as somebody who the CEO planned on putting in a COO position, so she wouldn't have to come into the office anymore. Both the new recruiter and the COO were awesome, and really helped take some of the tougher work off my back with their connections. Two weeks after hiring the would-be COO, who, by the way, has stellar credentials and experience, and is an all-around really great person, the two of them have an argument over something completely ridiculous, details were vague, but I understand that the CEO was basically flipping her sheet, because the COO wasn't recording every detail, if she so much as sneezed when the CEO wasn't around, a policy almost everyone in the office had serious issues with as well, because it took away from our working time. We never see our awesome COO to be again. A week later, our only administration recruiter stops coming to work, after spending a week working with the CEO, then comes back into the office one day, when the CEO isn't around, grabs some of her stuff, and just leaves. I'm starting to see that this CEO is somewhat poisonous to the company. I get worried, but hey, I'm doing my job, and thanks to the new recruiter, getting things done was a lot less frantic. I endure her bullshit, but keep on doing my job. On my last day, CEO comes in, and both my boss and the industrial recruiter are out of the office to do offside stuff, and in a rare happening, it just so happens that none of my temporary clients needed extra workers that day, we'd just lost one big client due to some cutbacks that restricted their ability to have a second employee in their warehouse, and our regular clients were either slow or well staffed enough to keep going. So I was just doing my regular spiel of setting up ads, seeking out potential clients, and putting candidate information on the system. CEO takes this one day of no activity to assume that I've lost all our clients, and that I've doomed the department. She starts talking to my department head, not my direct boss, but one of my superiors, rather loudly, talking about how I'd need to be retrained, after being with the company for 4 months, and how I was useless to the company. I knew that this was, in fact, her idea of motivating her staff, as though the fear of punishment would make them work better. I gave up, said fuck this, wrote a note of resignation, dropped it in front of her, and walked out of that building forever. Several weeks later, I'm working a different job that I actually got through a competing hiring agency, and the industrial recruiter I'd left behind texts me about how she's getting a new job with an actual business, not just a middleman company like a recruiting firm, and we get to talking about the state of the business. Without me, computer work had slowed to a crawl, and they actually had to resort to hiring one of our candidates who was pretty much a pure construction worker, to fill my place out of desperate on. Apparently the CEO took over my job, and was so overwhelmed by the work, that I completed easily on a daily basis, that the industrial temp placement desk kind of just crashed. I had a nice feeling of righteous smugness for the rest of the day. TLDR, Beach CEO berates me so much, that I quit my rather easy techie desk job, then tries to fill my shoes and busts out area of the company single handedly. Went to a Red Sox game at Yankees Stadium. Great time all around with my, Yankees fan, roommate and her awesome boyfriend, but around the middle of the game, this guy who had been amusing the stands by trash talking the other Sox fan in our vicinity, got bored with the lack of response, and turned his sights on me. This was all good naturedly, mind you. Our section was having fun. I had gone to the bathroom, then the hot dog stand, then the beer stand, so I had missed maybe 20 minutes due to lines. When I got back, he says, here's the Red Sox fan. Where'd you go for those beers? Brooklyn, I quipped. Did you get a real New Yorker to tell you how to find your way back? Or, hey, maybe you just got cornered and plugged in the bathroom by a bunch of Sox fans. I thought that was a decent crack, but suddenly I hear myself saying after a moment, huh, yeah, I guess they must have been Sox fans because they were on top. Moment of silence in the seats. Then the entire batch of Yankees fans loses it, and when it calms down, the guy gives me a high five, bro, I've got nothing for that. Just a solid moment in a perfect evening, right down to the rivalry. Well someone tried to ruin my reputation at college maybe a year ago, 
Repercussions if I was found responsible were expulsion from school. Some backstory. There was this girl. I'm going to call her Ike. Ike is one of those people who do things only for personal gain. To put down on her resume. She ended up being the president of the club I had just joined. Because in order to join mock trial at the school, I had to join this one. She plays her friend and I in charge, but wires got switched, and my friend and I called a meeting, when we weren't supposed to, words were said, I believe the word beach was thrown around. Next meeting comes by and my advisor walks in. Suddenly I'm being accused of making unwanted sexual advances on a girl, because apparently asking for a cup of coffee means I'm going to sexually assault you. They offered me a deal, that I took that would only suspend me from Mike's club, and not mock trial. I took it causa, my advisor told me to be, they were going on and on about my 420 habits c, they told me they would never mention it again, I begrudgingly took the deal, and maintained that I had never done anything wrong. The girl who Ike made the claim on behalf of posted on my walk, that I was cute and sexy 2 days, after I got suspended. Fast forward a year. I'm back in her club, Ike apologized told me it was all the VP's fault, and it wasn't her actually encouraged me to join. For three months, I was one of the most productive people in. I helped organize a charity that my club participated in. I raised over $500, the club total less than 700 Ike then tells us that she is changing the club to a business frat and that each of us need to pay 100 towards the new change bunch of people didn't like it, but I was the most vocal. I quit the club and walk out. I get a text that says Ike is going to use the money I raised as part of the club total. I don't like it that she was trying to use my accomplishments for her own good. I go back up and tell her no the money I raised is mine. If you want to look like a success do it yourself. I walked out. Two weeks later. I'm called into the dean's office. He tells me that Ike and her VP are pressing harassment and sexual harassment charges on me. Ike claimed that two years ago, I grabbed her as at a party, and said nice as. Oh and that thing I signed, yay that got brought back up. So now she makes it seem, like I have a history of doing this thing, that I've never done. Im to have a court date with advisors and people of that nature, to determine if I'm guilty. Part of these proceedings is, that they looked into the case and past claims. Im allowed to see all documents they come up with. The school called the original girl who Mikey filed the original case. The girl said he didn't do anything. I just wanted to be friends with Ike. That is what was written down. I thought it was done, and I could get this over with and move on. Ike cold dropped it, but instead decided to go through with the case. Claiming I was violent, and I yelled at her in a meeting. Also still claiming I grabbed her. When in court she got to bring witnesses. She asked the witness if I had yelled at her. The witness, he didn't yell. He was visibly upset. He pointed his finger but didn't yell. The shock on Ike's face was one of the greatest things I have ever seen. My own witness, Ike's roommate of three years, came in and told the court that I have never been to a party at their place with Ike, who was always at her boyfriend's. Fifteen minutes later him called in and told him not responsible for any of the actions. But that was after three months of wondering if I'm going to be expelled from college. That was countless sleepless nights and stress-induced insomnia. I wanted some sort of retribution for what this girl had said about me. So I went back to the dean and presented the same case she had tried to get me for. Harassment. I told the dean that this girl has for two years been slandering my name, calling me a chauvinist, and making claims that I have sexually assaulted women. These claims had been proven false by the school administration, and that I would like to take this to the court. I was asked by my advisor to drop it, but I told him that after he told me to sign the first deal I would not be listening to him. I'm vindictive, I'll admit it. But you can go around making those claims, and get away with it. I pushed the case. We went into the court session and I presented my evidence and witnesses. She had been telling girls some of which were my friends, that I touch women and I'm a chauvinist. My one friend came in and told this to the court. She also told them how she reacted when she said she knew me and knew about her. That was the kicker that pushed it over the top. Both her and I were told to leave the room. After 30 minutes, we were called in. 
she was found responsible for harassment which is behavior intended to disturb or upset, and it is characteristically repetitive. Her punishment is that she could not attend the school while I was there. I was a year behind her in school. She can't graduate for two years. TLDR girl accused me of sexual harassment. I beat the claim and got her expelled for harassment slash. Gather round kids and let me tell you the story of how my divorce lawyer laughed my ex-wife into oblivion. So, after 9 months of wonderful marriage, my ex-wife decides to up and fax some guy in her seps slash taps classes. For non-military folk, think of seps slash taps as becoming a civilian again classes. I find out due to her posting pics of them together slash lewd comments back and forth on misspace. Cuz I can, you know, see those. I filed for divorce, post haste. She begins to try and smear my name amongst both her and my own family and friends, claiming that I was physically abusive towards her and caused her to cheat not sure how I did this when I was stationed in California when this all went down. That began to backfire due to the obvious plot hole in her outlandish fantasy. Come divorcing time, I get all the paperwork situated with my newly hired divorce lawyer and then contacted my ex telling her if she has any questions to contact him. She does in fact contact him, continuing to smear my name and make this divorce go more in her favor, mainly because she knows with the evidence I had against her, she was gonna get legally gang banged. Thanks op for giving me inspiration for making up legal sexual terms. She begins to demand alimony due to the harsh change of lifestyle this divorce is putting her through. To humor her, my lawyer asks how long were you two married before you started your affair? She responded with 9 months, to which after a long pause, my lawyer responded with uncontrollable laughter and a big honkin no. TLDR my ex-wife was slash is dumb, asked lawyer for alimony, he laughs at her dumb face. I'm a bit late to the party, but thought I would throw my two cents in. My now ex-wife and I were separated at the time while attempting to work through the divorce proceedings. Our temporary custody agreement stated that for Christmas she would have our daughter for Christmas Eve and return her to my care on Christmas Day at 8am. The appointed time rolls around and she hasn't shown up. I give her 10 minutes before calling her cell. Straight to voice a mail. I attempt to call over the next hour. No go. Call the friend that she was staying with at the time. She had kicked me out of the house and was evicted three weeks later due to sanitation and noise complaints in an attempt to reach her. Was told that she didn't know where she was and that I should stop calling. Something fishy is a float. Call my attorney. She advises us to wait to see if there is any contact and to just stay calm for hours later I receive a phone call on my cell. The area code is 907. My ex-wife is from Alaska. With a sinking feeling in my gut I answer the phone. The person on the other end identifies themselves as an Anchorage Police Department officer and states that he needs to know my location so that he can serve me with an emergency order of protection that has been filed against me. I crack a bit at this point and begin laughing. I collect myself and tell the officer to drive north till he hits Tok Junction, make a right at the Alcan, take another right at the Sweet Grass Crossing, a left at Kansas and straight on till Kentucky. You can't miss it. The officer then asks to clarify that I'm not in Anchorage, Alaska. I confirm and he and I ponder for a few minutes how I can possibly be enough of an immediate threat to warrant an EPO. He wishes me luck and we disconnect the call. First thing the next day once all the government offices reopen I get an emergency custody order from the family court judge in Kai and hire another attorney in Anchorage to appear for me at the hearing that is scheduled for the next day. I then attempt to file charges with every law enforcement body in the county, but I'm blocked by the county attorney. He and my ex-wife were great friends in church, who takes the stance that it is a civil matter, not criminal. Cue a mad rush to get a flight to Alaska to attend the next hearing. We appear. She represents herself. Claims my then three-year-old daughter says that I hit her and lock her in a dark room. The judge rips her to shreds. My attorney does the same and asks for the petition for protection be dismissed and that the state of Alaska recognize the Kai court order. They agree and order her to hand my daughter over within two hours. She does. We fly home. These actions, coupled with her blatant lying, psych evil, 
and admitted alcoholism wrecked her case. I received residential custody. She got twice weekly visitation, a child support order, and a recommendation to the Commonwealth Attorney for contempt of court charges. Funny thing is that, if she hadn't lost it, she would have probably retained custody of my daughter. She has now given up her parental rights in exchange for me forgiving all of her child support debt. TLDR, ex-wife goes nuts, kidnaps our daughter on Christmas Eve, and disappears to Alaska. I'm on my phone so forgive any formatting slash spelling errors. Oh this one is easy. So I mostly take care of my kid, but I also write books. Writing books is a nice minimum wage job. So anyway it looked like the wife was going to get laid off so I started to try and find a 9 to 5 job. I went into one interview at cable network and it went it okay. Called back for the second interview. It went fine, but it was more technical. Wasn't so nervous this time, so I looked around. My book was on the bookshelf. Didn't say anything. Third damn interview. Not going well, I could tell that I wasn't going to get hired. So they ask me a question, we'll pretend it was how to copy a Yadab video, and I say well, it changes all the time, the best way right now is Yada, Yada Yada which wasn't the best way. They say well we really need more computer experience. Thanks for coming in. About 20 minutes later I get an email, the instructions in the book don't work anymore. What can I do now? It would be so awesome if I said why didn't you ask me when I was there today or something but I didn't. I just answered the email with the new information. Because they had bought the book and they deserved the answer. My parents owned a plant nursery that they opened up when I was in middle school. I was there for basically all the time working when I wasn't in school, so I knew pretty much everything about the plants and other pottery nonsense that we offered. It was a family business, so the only people that worked there were me and my parents. My mom and I were the ones who took care of the customers and the plants, while my dad did more of the landscaping and other laborious tasks which of course I was there to help too. Well the summer right after my senior year a lady comes in with her head so far up her as you could smell the beach odor she gave off. My parents were out getting more plants, so I was the only there to manage the shop. This lady comes up to me and asks me about the names of a certain plant and information about it. I give her the name and tell her about how to take care of it to which she chuckled at and began telling me that everything I told her about it was wrong and I didn't know what I was talking about because she's a master gardener. At this time I'm thinking, why the fuck is she asking me about it, if she apparently knows all about it, but I really don't want to be rude. I apologize to her, and tell her that's how we've been taking care of them for years and that what everybody calls them. She's still adamant about it, and says they are called another name. I tell her that's just another variation of the same plant just a different leaf shape. At this point she's reached maximum level beach, and is yelling at me in front of other customers. She demands to see the manager of the shop. I just look at her for a second with a blank stare and tell her I'll go get him. I go in the house and grab a sip of water and my cap then I proceed to walk back out to her with a plant handbook that has the picture of the plant she's talking about and the one we have. I put on the fackest smile I have and present myself as the manager and ask her if this is the plant she was looking for as I present her with the booklet. She shuts right the fuck up and asks me if I was the owner. I tell her my family owns the business and I've been working there since we opened. She apologizes buys the plant and takes off without another word. I had other customers come up to me with a smile and tell me I have the patience of a saint. Any other person wouldn't have dealt with that kind of rudeness and well just kick the beach out. TLDR cunt comes in beaching to me that I'm wrong and she wants to see the manager. I put on cap and grin and tell her I'm the manager and correct her on what she was for sure was right. I work a sheety job in a warehouse. One of our assistant store managers is a grade A cunt whom I'm fairly certain has teeth in her vagina. She makes unreasonable requests and many people have quit instead of dealing with her. One day she told me I had to assemble 30 grills in 2 hours. I explained that I would get as many as I could get done. Done. She started yelling at me saying I wouldn't be allowed to leave until the job was done. I very calmly explained to her that I would be leaving at the end of my shift. She of course freaked out and started screaming at me. 
I didn't back down and explained that it was against store policy to hold any hourly associate beyond their scheduled end without permission or at least 48 hours notice. She started yelling at me saying I was making stuff up, that she could do whatever she wanted, and if I gave her crap again, I would be out of the store. Now out of the three managers in the store she is the only one who doesn't regularly ask me about store policy, something I know a lot about. And being that I don't care about the job very much, I have a degree in psychology and criminal justice, and am actively looking for a new job. I didn't back down. She ended up getting chewed out by human resources and hates me. Cut to recently, about two months later. The same situation comes up, she again threatens to keep me late, this time without paying overtime. When she tells me she will report me to her superiors for insubordination I offer her the phone. She fumes, but backs down. Apparently seeing me stand up to her has given other people courage to start standing up to her. Now, she is not allowed to work without another manager present and is on a final warning policy with the store. Any more mistakes, she gets fired. Now that I have one I'm really hoping my job hunt pays off. This was in 6th grade. We had a group project to be done, and I took the responsibility of becoming the group leader, because the work was not progressing, and basically, my other group mates were lazier than me. I ended up doing 80% of the work, 9.5% on both the other two, and less than 1% by our a shat of a grapnet. After passing our work to our professor, she asked all the group leaders to grade the other people in their respective groups honestly, and I obliged. I graded the other two at around 70% and the non-functioning one at 50%. Our professor saw this and decided to meet up with the three without me knowing. I guessed just to ask what happened and showed them what grade I gave to them. The two accepted it and went to talk with me. They understood and respected my decision and apologized for not working much harder. The other one tried to bully me together with his posse. The day after, the professor announced that she has to redo the grading sheet because some group had grades below the minimum. Passing slash minimum equal 75%. The whole class became so quiet because they know it was our group. Then this guy says out loud ha so much for giving low grades with a smirk. The professor then said irritatedly, well if you really deserve the grade, then I'll give you that. That wiped out his smirk. His friends who were laughing immediately pretended they never heard anything. Thanks Miss Ella. This happened about 7 months ago now. I was in a long term relationship, 3 and a half years, with a young woman who had been loving, kind and considerate. Then it stopped. For a year, I was treated like sheet, physically and verbally abused to the point that I was having full body convulsive fits from the stress of it. After telling her that I needed some time away from her to get things back to how they used to be, she agreed. The next day, she texted me a dozen times, called me half a dozen times, and sent me a handful of emails asking what she could do to make it better. After telling her that the best thing she could do was to give me some space, let me figure things out, she agreed to it and backed away. The next day, the same goddamn thing, except this time she was getting angry at me for wanting to spend time away from her. Though I was aware that she had a selfish side, we are all human after all, I never thought that she could erupt into such a frenzied rage over not getting her way. That was when I knew I was going to have to end it. The next day, I drove to her house and did the deed. I'll let her down as easily as possible, or so I'm told. In response, I was told that I was killing her, that she hated me, and wished I slash she slash everyone was dead. I blocked her attempt at driving away with my car, not wanting her in a one-ton death machine while emotionally distraught. After calling her mother, who told me that she had been expecting this for some time and came over straight away, I left. Skip a month ahead. I'm dating the only friend who gave a damn about me during that period. She is beautiful, hilarious, intelligent and as compassionate as mother that sat on a barn full of peaceweed. She has helped me regain what little confidence I had and to start seeing myself as more than just a failure. So about a month into this wonderful relationship, I get a call from one of my friends who took my ex's side. Block her number and her ML address. She's going to do something stupid. Moments later, my girlfriend receives an email which basically boiled down to he was cheating on me with my best friends, yes, plural, and getting them to show him their tigs. 
Now, I'm going to be honest with you here. In terms of charisma, I'm maybe a 5 out of 10. I'm so pathetically average that I could be used as an extra in a slow ammo crowd shot in an action movie. So the concept of me getting anyone to do anything is so hilariously wrong that I couldn't help but laugh. One of the friends I was apparently cheating on her with was the same one who sent me the warning. But it wasn't what I thought that counted. It was what my girlfriend thought. I was prepared for the worst, to have my heart shattered into a million pieces and crushed underfoot. She laughed and responded that, if I was going to be checking out other women, that we were going to do it together and love it. In the end, my ex lost a lot of friends, because of her little stunt, including the lovely young woman, called Ye, who warned us in the first place. Ye, and my girlfriend get along famously. TLDR abusive ex attempts, to ruin new relationship and fails. Well, when I was a freshie in high school, there was this annoying kid that no one liked, but pretended to like, we all know one. One day, we were in the class of a nice teacher that was strict on only one rule, if you weren't in your seat, when the bell rang, you were tardy, even if you were in the classroom. Anyways, before said class, this kid walks up to me with red chalk on his fingers. And, of course, since I was wearing a white shirt, he decides to run towards me with his fingers out. I sidestepped him and watched him tumble into a desk. Laughter, but then he got pissed in and came at me again. This time he was slower, more deliberate. So, I grabbed one of his outstretched hands and twisted it behind his back and slammed him into the wall. Everyone laughed, but then the bell rang. The teacher came in, called us out, said we were tardy and had to go get slips. So anyways, we walk to the office, laughing, while he's furious. So, when we get to the office, he immediately asks if he can get it excused and makes up this ridiculous story of me beating him up. The lady says talk to your teacher, gives him a wrestle ipe, and he walks away. Now it's my turn. Luckily, I know this lady, and she's great friends with our family, it's got benefits, bro. She also knows him, and knows he's lying. So, I tell her what actually happened, we both had a good laugh, but she still has to give me a tardy. Bear in mind I didn't ask to get it excused. And that's my story. Also, for those who need to know, when we went back to the class, he asked the teacher to excuse it. She called me over to talk about it, but I just laughed and told her to excuse it for him, that it was my fault. I wasn't going to go through that, he would've gotten his way in the end. When my ex-husband and I were still separated, we would share custody of our year and a half old son. He, more often than not, would cancel his weekends with our son and would occasionally show up to do things as a family, like go see Spider-Man 2. Sometime during the separation, our son got pink eye and a cold. I worked 12 hour night shifts at the hospital where his doctor worked. My boss at the time was the worst human being I have ever met, but that's another story. I spoke to the doctor about the signs and symptoms and the doctor wrote me a prescription. The pink eye was treated with gentamis and eye drops and the cold was a viral infection that I couldn't do anything about other than give Tylenol. It eventually cleared up and everything went back to normal. On a Tuesday about 2 or 3 weeks later, my husband calls me to say our daker provider just quit. I was shocked and thought he was joking because she was one of my best friends at the time and she didn't have the decency to call me. That basically ended our friendship and I never understood why she didn't call and talk to me. I found her years later on Facebook and she never told me why she did that but told me she couldn't be friends with someone who took such risque photos. I had done some pinup modeling but no nudity. She preached to me then promptly deleted me. He said she quit because I didn't get our son medical care and alluded to medically neglecting our son. I explained that I got medication for our son's eyes but nothing could be done about the cold. The following Thursday, the Florida Department of Children and Family called me to say someone had reported me, nearly word for word what my husband had said on Tuesday, as medically neglecting my son and they needed to investigate my home. They came in and investigated my apartment, my son's prescriptions for pink eye, my food supply, and the general cleanliness of my apartment. The young social worker then scheduled a meeting with her boss for later in the week. 
she informed me she had already visited my husband's apartment and mentioned that my living arrangement was much different than his. He had a roommate, a girlfriend, and multiple people in and out of the house while I had just my son and me. She tried to reassure me that things would work out okay. The day arrived to meet with the social worker supervisor. My husband met me there and we began answering the questions. I answered respectfully and honestly, but the supervisor called me a liar. Then I clammed up while the man started to verbally attack my character. I sat through being berated and judged unfairly for over two hours. I was sobbing while this man put me down, told me I was an awful parent, how awful military personnel are as parents, and how I didn't deserve to be a mother, yet he barely mentioned my husband's actions. My husband finally interrupts the supervisor's tirade and asks if she ends up being found an unfit mother, I automatically get custody, right? The supervisor says no, both of us would be unfit since we were still married. That's when I knew for sure who called it all in. My husband accused me of medical neglect to hurt me and get custody of our son whom he rarely saw when he had the any and every opportunity to do so. I will never forget the supervisor, how he was so cruel and made sure he made me feel terrible for doing nothing wrong. Later on, I found out, after months of calling back for follow-ups on my case, that the claims were unsubstantiated and found to be false. They had closed the case 9 months prior, or about 3 months after the report, and failed to inform me, nor did they ever send me copies of the report. My husband and I were finally divorced the following year, 2004, and when he got out of the military, he disappeared. We haven't seen or heard from him since September 2005, when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, to tell me he had survived the hurricane by going to Texas. Not once in that phone call did he ask about our son. I still don't understand why he tried to get custody, only to abandon his son later. My son has no idea what his father is like. I try never to badmouth his father because, honestly, his father is a sad, messed up guy who had a lot of potential, but screwed it up due to fear and insecurities. It's more upsetting that he's missed out on his son's life and my son is extremely hurt by his father's absence. TLDR, ex-husband tried to get custody of our son by falsely accusing me of medical neglect with the state of Florida, only to split later. I haven't seen or heard from his father since 2005. Not me, but my parents divorce. When my parents were getting divorced, my mom was getting child support for three kids, my dad was poor, and suddenly, she kicked my oldest brother out of the house because he didn't like her new boyfriend who was sleeping over all the time, giving us advice, telling my mom how much he didn't like us, etc. So she kicks my oldest brother out, and then in court, the judge informed her she'd be receiving child support for one child now. She was confused, as she still had two children, and demanded to know why she was being stiffed. She also took time in court to enumerate the reasons why my oldest brother couldn't live with her anymore he was a bad son, disrespectful, out of control, needed a father figure, blah blah blah. After the judge explained that my dad was taking on the financial responsibility of one child, so two of us cancelled each other out, leaving only one unaccounted for child. She said well, if that's the case, he'll have to come and live with me again. It was from that point on that everyone knew my mom was bad sheet crazy and only out for herself in the divorce. We were all caught in the middle, and my dad still got faked, but everyone felt bad for him afterward. She's less crazy now, and we love her again. TLDR, mom is a big ol' beach. Late to the thread, so this is going to be buried, but whatever. Back in the day my grandfather was a Coca-Cola truck driver. This was actually sort of a big deal, because Coke truck drivers didn't just drive the stuff around they were actually responsible for selling all the product in their trucks too. They had to drive around, find buyers, and sell the stuff. This, of course, meant that there was a coke truck driver union. Now, my grandfather was apparently one of the only, if not the only, Jewish member of this union. That's because, from what he had told me, that Jewish folks just weren't hired for direct sales jobs like that at the time. It's pretty good props to him for his sales ability, that he even had the job in the first place, much less that he managed to keep it, etc. 
One day, at a union meeting, my grandfather stands up to ask a question. The union leader heading the meeting takes a look at him and says, sit down, kike. Another thing to know about my grandfather, and in fact that whole side of my family, is that he was a golden gloves boxer. His father, http, en, dot wikipedia, dot org, slash wiki, slash, was at one point a world champ notorious for knocking people out despite being much lighter than them, larger weight classes then, I think. His father-in-law was a champion featherweight boxer. Basically, he could throw a punch. So this guy mouths off to my grandfather. My grandpa stands up, walks up to the guy, and just lays him out with one punch. He then quit on the spot, because fuck working with anti-semitic as holes, and promptly got a job working as a Pepsi truck driver, and continued on as is. I live on a lake every year on the third Saturday in July. We have what is called La Torana Day in celebration for the estimated birthday of the lake. Name of the lake is La Torana. If you couldn't tell from context, in a nutshell, La Torana Day is just a huge excuse to wake up at 7 a.m. and drink until you can't stand up huge tie up parties. Everybody having a good time, even if you don't know them. The works so this year my buddies and I decide it's time to go in, as we had been drinking for 12 or so hours we leave the group of boats we were tied up to and start to float away. We still had another boat tied onto us, so we decided to hang out for another 10 or 15 minutes with them a verbal argument broke out about colleges, said verbal argument lead to a friend of mine getting pushed into the other boat full of 30 to 40 year old testosterone filled drunk males, were all in our early 20s by the way, and they all started swinging at us me being the smart person and not wanting to fuck with it decides it's time to go we get out of there for a minute and then the other boat swings around i look and see a guy on the front of their boat with an anchor in his hands and a very angry look on his face i'm thinking oh shit he's gonna try to throw this at us keep in mind there are at least 20 people on my boat and it definitely would have sent someone to the hospital the other boat gets close enough and the guy throws it thanks to his stupidity he didn't let go of the faking thing and dropped it along with him into the water about three seconds later i see the end of the rope go into the water with them laughs ensued and we got out to there as we were leaving I turned around to see their boat capsizing great success. TLDR, I was partying on my boat with my friends, a fight broke out from another boat, a dude tried to throw an anchor at us, fell in the water, lost the anchor, and the other boat capsized shortly thereafter. I was in 7th grade, and there was this little tattletale named Vanessa. The teacher knew Vanessa was a tattletale. We hated each other. The teacher got a call over the PA and had to leave class. She left Vanessa in charge of the class and told her that if anyone talked, she was to write their name on the board. Well of course as soon as the teacher leaves Vanessa writes my name on the board for no reason other than spite. The teacher comes back and says oh, Mr. Eleven, I'm not surprised. I'm assigning you to detention after school I tried to defend myself, but the teacher didn't believe me. I was a bit of a troublemaker in 7th grade, after the period ended, we switched classes. I was determined to get this beach back. I ran to the gym and grabbed a dodgeball. I tracked Vanessa down before her next class and hit around a corner. When she walked around the corner, I threw the dodgeball and hit her right in the face. I immediately ran back to the earlier class and started talking to the teacher. A few minutes later, we hear Vanessa screaming down the hall Mr. Eleven hit me in the face with a ball. But no one saw anything, and as far as the teacher was concerned, I was in the room with her. The teacher actually apologized to me for believing Vanessa, and took away the detention. That Vanessa never bothered me again. TLDR teacher leaves, girl lies to get me in trouble. I assault the girl with a dodgeball, but no one saw. Teacher ends up being my alibi for assault and believes me. Back in the late 80s I was a stupid kid with long hair driving a sports car, basically begging every cop in the world to pull me over. A lot of them did but one of them stands out in my mind. I was driving my girlfriend back to her house. There was an interchange from the interstate highway to the state highway that I had to take to get back to her house. Traveling north on the interstate, the two left lanes of the interstate became a downhill ramp that became the two left lanes of the state highway going west. Those two lanes eventually merged into a single lane. 
It was possible, on a clear and dry day, to take this ramp at 50 miles per hour with hardly any effort, but the posted limit for the ramp was 35 and the state highway was 50. One noteworthy feature of this ramp was that it was extremely easy to see the oncoming traffic on the state highway as you were above the highway for about one quarter mile as you descended and joined the highway proper. So this one day I'm taking the ramp at about 45. As soon as I clear the curve I see a cop car traveling in the middle lane on the state highway. I ease off the gas and at the same time I see a dark blue Honda in my side view mirror approaching fast. He screams past me easily doing 65 miles per hour, never slowing down, cutting into traffic without a signal, and the cop car just completely ignores the Honda. I know what's coming, so I make a mental note of the Honda's license plate before it completely disappears. By the time I hit the highway I'm doing a steady 50 miles per hour. The cop is riding my blind spot to my right. I'm in the left lane, so I ease it up to 55. The cop stays with me. My girlfriend's exit is coming up, so I put my signal on and slow down. The cop stays with me, never giving me the room to change lanes. I drop down to 45, then 40. Cop stays with me the whole time, and now there are angry drivers behind me who want me to move over. Before I miss the exit I goose the throttle and get it up to 55 to make some space between me and the cop. Immediately his lights go on and he pulls me over. By this time my girlfriend had my registration. The cop took my paperwork, went to his car, and came back a few minutes later to give me a warning. I took my paperwork and put it away, then looked the cop in the eye while I tore his warning in half, crumpled it up, threw it in my back seat and drove away. When I was in 6th grade the class bully would spend weeks getting close to people and finding out deep secrets about them. He would spend full on months doing this. I caught onto his plan the second time he did it to me. I told him that I make out with my sister, my parents have sex with the dog, and that my next door neighbor is a hitman, or something along the lines. I made it pretty perverse for an 11 year old. His plan was to come out and call me out on these things in front of the whole class, which I pretty much waited for. One day we are talking like normal friends do, then he starts being an asshole, and I mean not an a-hole, but like he starts throwing my homework away, saying that everything I'm doing is stupid, he's really putting effort into putting me down. I start calling him on his sheet. By the end of the day I was ready. I knew this faker was ready to blow his lid and tell the whole class all my dirty secrets. He called me inhumane for some reason, and I told him that kicking dogs was inhumane, which he was known for doing to his pets. Then he's ready he yells in the front of the class as school's about to be dismissed oh yeah well at least I don't make out with my sister. And my parents don't have sex with the dog, and my neighbors aren't raging serial killers trying to kill me. At this point I'm pretending to be afraid of his power then everybody looks at him, laughs and says what. The teacher calls him out of class and scolds him. I got another kid to do the same thing over a year later. This time he thought the kid was a rapist that kills children. During my freshman year of high school, I was hanging out with my friends at lunch. There was this kid, let's call him Abraham, that everyone knew. He was also a freshman, but he was small for his age, I would guess 5 feet tall and 110 pounds. He always tried to act tough and do stupid things that he believed would make him popular. Which I can understand, because he was small and maybe he thought by acting tough, nobody would push him around. Anyways, me and my friends are hanging out by the side of one of the buildings right in front of the bushes. I had my back to the bushes and Abraham comes up. So we talk for a bit, and I see him looking at me, then at the bushes, and then back at me. I knew exactly what he was planning on doing once I saw him eyeing the bushes. I guess he chose me as the victim, because I was one of the bigger freshmen, 5 feet 8 inches and 200 pounds, and he probably thought by humiliating me, nobody would mess with him, because he would get them back. Since I knew what was going to happen, I just stood there and waited. About a minute later he made his move. Even though we were only about 3 feet away from each other, he charged me and tried to push me into the bush. I took a step to the left. That step caused him to run right by me and fall into the bush. My friends were cracking up and some other kids around were also laughing their heads off. He slowly climbed out of the bush and walked away. 
I continued to see him around school after that, but he never talked to me or my friends after that incident. Then midway through sophomore year, I stopped seeing him around school. I soon found out that he no longer attends our school. I don't know if he transferred schools or got expelled, but I'm pretty sure that it is because of all the problems he caused by messing with the other students. TLDR. Kid tries to push me in a bush, but he falls in instead and transfers schools due to embarrassment. I decided to get out of my comfort zone and went on a big lads holiday with people I didn't know, sort of new one, but there are about 20 people here. Most were down to earth types, but a couple were the loud obnoxious and arrogant types that think they're God's gift that I normally avoid. One of these decided he'd take an interest in me and was constantly talking sheet, making jokes at my expense and pulling pranks, like forgetting my drink on his round. Whatever, I didn't really care and had a good time. Last night we are getting taxis to some restaurant in a further away town than the one we were closest to and going clubbing thereafter. Last taxi load pulls up and said idiot gets in just before me and shuts the door screaming to the driver to go, all of them laughing hilariously as they go. Now I didn't have a clue where we were going or eating and I'm there alone, so I decided fuck it and had a nice night at the hotel bar and met some cool people. Next morning we are getting the coach to the airport and most of the group is late. As they stumble on down it seems that about three quarters of them had something at the restaurant that gave them horrible food poisoning, and they'd got caught out in a club, about 15 guys projecting out both ends in a toilet with three stalls, and of course my new friend was one of them. I felt sorry for them all but him, but it did seem like some instant karmic justice. I made sure to lord it up at the airport ordering a few pints as they all sat hunched over plastic bags full of puke. I've worked at a Starbucks for less than a year, started in October brand new to the whole business, but I've been told by many of my cowhawkers that I picked up all the job tasks really quickly, ringing, making drinks, cleaning, etc. I even got partner of the quarter and a small raise after 6 months and a good employee review. Basically, I'm a good worker. I show up on time, have never called out, never missed shifts, and get my stuff done when it needs to be. Another girl got hired a few short weeks after I did. She was a friend of one of the shift leads, so she was hired on recommendation only. From that point, everyone, even the shift lead, was annoyed by how slow and not a good worker she was. But no one had real reason to complain, just had to adjust to having a weak member of the team. So, here's where it's relevant. A month before this girl moves and transfer from our store, I made the mistake of correcting her while she was ringing. One of the big things the company is trying I reduce is waste. So, it's better to ring everything up as it's supposed to be. My manager loves me for my insistence that I ring up every drink modification. Anywho, I must have corrected her one too many times and she went to talk to a shift lead about it. The shift lead feeling obligated to report any conflicts tells our manager. Manager has a talk with me and basically says, you were in the right, thanks for doing your job. Don't worry she's gone in a month. And tells me she talked with the girl and told her she should be ringing in things correctly. TLDR, Kawaka tries to complain about me correcting her work. Manager thanks me for being a good worker. Kawaka gets reprimanded for doing job wrong. Fun fact. Her frustration led to her telling a different cowwalker that, because of my correcting her, she wished she could just punch me. That cowwalker told me, I'm no fighter. But I do know that's not at all cool, and could have easily written to the employee snitch line, and had her transfer and job put in jeopardy. This isn't really a ha ha fuck you sheethead, story as the guy had happened to us, and still is a good friend. Anyway, school trip and we go to Venice, the drinking laws over there are different, so teachers tell us we can drink as long as we get a form signed. So the first night rolls around and there I'm almost passed out in the corner of one my friend's hotel rooms with a 2 litre bottle of coke filled half with coke and half whiskey. I crawl back to my bed as the night winds down point I wake up in the morning and my buddies are laughing in the morning, both about shit that happened the last night and something else. Turns out in our drunken state one of my friends thought it would be hilarious to try and stick his dick in my ear, I know, what the fuck right, and instead stumbled and dragged it across my face. 
Anyway, we get back from the trip and we are telling stories to everyone else. Then that story gets told, and it does not have the reaction my friend clearly intended, especially after I made the point that I was technically unconscious from the sheer amount of whiskey and coke I had consumed. Everyone laughed and we carried on, but you could see on his face as the tide turned straight on him as people were all like what the fuck dude, why would you do that? I called him the face rapist for a while after that. Long story alert, when I started the 10th grade I was kind of short and fat, along with being really out of shape. I joined the band, and was picked on all year, in January I had enough of the marching sheet, and decided to join the football team. I still had to be in the band until the end of the year and that is where the trouble began. There was this kid we'll call him Jack, that just constantly faked with me, even though he was a year younger. I was a real pacifist, and tried not to start cheat or even remotely retaliate. In the beginning of May we had just finished up spring practice when Jack went for the kill. One day he decided to take all the percussion mallets and throw them at me from across the room, hitting me in the face. I had finally had enough, and challenged him to a fight. That afternoon we met to settle the situation he brought three other band friends with him wanting to jump me, unbeknownst to me the word of the fight had gotten around along with his plan. I showed up with some girls that wanted to tag along, and I saw that I was severely outnumbered. About 10 seconds later two cars pull up with the starting defense of the football team. Jack's friends gave him a fact the plan look and backed off. The fight still occurred he threw a punch and hit me in the jaw. The next punch I ducked and threw him over my shoulder to the ground and mounted him. I hit him about 15 to 20 times before the mailman came and pulled me off of him. When he got up he was bleeding from the nose, mouth, and back, from landing on broken glass. Fast forward to the next day I was called into the vice principal's office for missing detention the day before to fight Jack. At my school this was grounds for immediate suspension. The vice principal looked at me and said, don't forget you have detention today, go back to class and what you did yesterday I wanted to do for a year. Jack ended up with 3 days suspension for starting the fight and I never was faked with again. TLDR I beat up a bully and was thanked by the vice principal. The following happened to my dad when he was a teen. Not exactly sure of all the details, but I know the good stuff pretty well. So I'll try to explain it the best I can. There was this girl in my dad's school. From what I can remember they did get along for a while. Until something happened between my dad's mom and her mom. Causing a rift of some sort. Can't remember who was at fault. Anyways, after whatever happened between the parents, she started to basically harass my dad and complain to the principal of the school, saying stuff like he hit her or something else along those same lines. This became so much a problem that my dad, that since he housed, was close enough to the school, he was forced by the school staff and or principal to go have lunch at home. This went on for a few months until one day she finally screwed up. On this particular day, she went and complained to principal that my dad had hit her. Which apparently prompted the principal to ask something along the lines of is that so? Which of course she said yes. Well he kindly informed her that he had confirmation from a local hospital that my dad was slash had undergoing surgery that day. So there was no way he was in or able to go to school that day. After I guess my dad recovered from the surgery and went back to school. The principal told my dad after that all that happened, that if he wanted to basically inflict harm on her just once, he would fully allow it, and he wouldn't get in trouble, and that he would also do something else too which I can't quite remember right now. He declined the offer. I don't think he had any more problems in school after her screw up either. When I was 14 years old, my dad bought me a beat up old 1970 Nova that we planned on restoring together. Thanks to his California county job that doesn't pay jack which means he does marriage and family counseling on the side, we had neither the time nor money to get this thing up to snuff. Fast forward 3 years, I'm a high school senior, my little sister's a freshman. I'm driving my Nova despite it having all sorts of issues, and my little sister tells me she's taking home two of her friends home with us. These naughty brat girls get into my car, and we start heading home. I take the back way, because my poor car doesn't do so good on the main roads thanks to fuel issues. Going through the neighborhoods, every time we turn, my back tires, which were fat thanks to the previous owner, rubbed up against the wheel wells, 
Thanks in part to the fatness and the terrible suspension which consisted of a single leaf spring on each side, which produced an odd sound. The girls in the back are giggling and making bratty remarks, and as a 17 year old boy who loves cars, and especially the car I'd worked on for 3 years, I basically felt like somebody had grabbed my newborn autistic child and proceeded to squish its soft head and tell everybody how stupid it is. My sister turns to me in an effort to seem coolish in front of her friends and says what's that weird noise? I turn to her and very casually say, well my back tires are pretty wide and they're rubbing against the wheel wells because my suspension can't handle all the extra weight in the back. I drove triumphantly in magnificent and utter silence, interrupted only by the squeaking of my tires which seemed to cheer me on the rest of the way home. A month after I had a major nervous breakdown, my wallet was snatched from my backpack while getting on a train on the escalator where there are no cameras. Reported it, had my credit card blocked, then went to the bank where it turned out the thieves had made two withdrawals within five minutes of the theft, the equivalent of seven, eight hundred dollar sign. Bank extended me credit so I could buy a new ticket and get to my dad's 65th birthday on time. Monday I went to the police station again with a bank statement to document my losses requested. Was led into an office by a very cute and smiling civilian dressed policeman who then spent half an hour grilling me mercilessly about my economy and expenses in every detail, where I shopped and why, who I lived with etc. Accused me of staging the whole thing because students swindle with credit cards all the time, ripping a card off that fast was impossible, and he'd never seen or heard of an MO like it in his entire long career, he looked 28, maximum. Being a highly nervous sap with an excessive faith in authority, I turned into a blubbering mess, while he and his buddy at the other desk were clearly struggling not to laugh at my act. While escorting me out he switched personalities completely and laughed it off, telling me it wasn't so serious, like it was a faking game. Only then did he give me his name and rank, I sheet you not, he was detective c underscore, darn. Doesn't carry the same meaning here, but still. I spent the next 24 hours fearing I'd be convicted of fraud and never get a job. Then Mr. Dunn called to tell me he had checked the train station's security footage and decided to buy my story, which I guess was the closest he could come to an apology. I later learned from the local paper and radio that he had seen two Polish men following me around and looking over my shoulder while I was entering my pin in the ticket machine. As it happened, they were still around. A bystander helped him detain one, while the other knocked him on his ass, split his lip, and did a runner. Later a dog patrol found the guy hiding in a dumpster in the harbor. Apparently there had been 10 reports of the exact same memo in neighboring stations over the weekend, which the Don could have very easily found out, but practicing his cross-interrogation skills on me was more fun I guess. Insurance covered everything. I testified against one of the thieves in court and he looked miserable. Sadly I never got around to writing a complaint against the detective, probably wouldn't have accomplished much either, and the local press made him look like the fearless action hero of the day. I'd rather give that medal to the bystander who stepped in to help, though. TLDR, power tripping detective named Dung accuses me of credit card fraud, after I've been robbed, then the real culprit busts his lip and makes him look like an as. Sort of. When I was a senior in high school, my English teacher was out for a day for whatever reason. We had a very moody sub come in, who I guess didn't like being a sub, why? I had a lollipop from that same class the previous day and began eating it. The sub looked at me and said I need to give it to her, there's no eating in the classroom. The entire class looks at her while I say that I got it from the teacher she was subbing for and it was okay. The sub says she doesn't believe me, and the rest of the class jumps in backing up my story. The sub still doesn't believe me, and that I need to throw it away. I then proceed to get up, show her the wrapper to my lollipop, then the pack of lollipops that the teacher had stashed proving they were the same. She still doesn't believe me, and says she's going to write me up and send me to the office. At this time, I was in pretty good with my assistant. Principal, so I told her I'd save her the trouble. I walked down to his office, told him what was going on, and that someone needs to tell her she doesn't need to be subbing if she can't take kids telling her she's wrong. 
he told me to sit in his office till the day was over. We shoot the sheet for about an hour and I leave. Come back the next day, the regular teacher is back, says that she was forced to come back in thanks to what I did, the sub got fired. I explained to her the whole story and that I had no intention on forcing her to come back to school. I offered to make it up to her since I liked her, but she laughed at the whole thing and declined. TLDR. Beachy sub says to throw away candy from same class of the day before. I go to office. Get sub fired. In elementary school I was known as that kid that you can't take the ball from on the soccer field. I know it's a weird title, but go along with it, okay? Essentially, I played soccer at lunch hour, and I was impossible to steal the ball from. It's not that I was particularly skilled, or anything either. I was just a big kid. People who got near me when I was barreling down the field were pushed aside like cattle in front of a freight train. Get the picture? Okay, now for the story. So this new kid moves into town, and it turns out he liked to play soccer. So he comes onto the field and asks if he can play, and of course we say sure and to pick a side. He notices about halfway through the game that any time I had the ball, people just left me along as I went down the field. So, he asked my buddy why, and he told him that I was that kid that you can't take the ball from on the soccer field. What happened next was probably my lifetime's first challenge accepted scenario. So, I'm kicking the ball down the field clumsily, and he decides to try and steal the ball from me. He comes from my blind side as I'm distracted from something happening on the other side of the field. He comes low and goes for a sliding tackle. Now, what happens next I only heard from people looking on. This kid was pretty small. Grade 5 or 6, maybe 4 minutes and 10 seconds. I was in grade 7 and pushing the 5 feet 8 inch mark. I was a big kid. As he slides into my feet to kick the ball away, our ankles lock. Inertia is a beach apparently because I kept running and this poor kid was sent spinning out into a glorious spiral across the ground, landing flat on his face. I hardly felt it, but I turned around to see him not moving on the ground. The kid was alright, but he never again tried to take my soccer ball away. Defame is a technical term. Don't use it like that. And since you didn't deny the statement you technically are defaming her. Also, although I'm not an American I'm a solicitor in the defamation capital of the world, I don't think you can defame someone with a question. Poetry definitely, but a question you could respond no to no. Also it takes two to tango. And going from the above I don't think you are very nice man, and are a dumb as regardless. And my prejudices against rappers make it easy to believe you got as good as you gave. I realize this isn't important. The story was just another chapter in the fad on us credit to get up votes by telling a personal story then asking a question. That it was a bad story and you being a dumbass is what's important. Also you missed out the best part of the story. Why your wife would say that specific thing. Why not do you still rap dogs? Obviously at some point you did think you were an alien. Or your wife can think on the spot very well. Story is just the right mix of crazy and credible, along with being impossible to prove either way, to fuck up a custody hearing.